further ado, I would like to introduce Noel Ellis, who is the Director of Engineering, Learning, and University Relations at Raytheon. Thank you, Chelsea, and good afternoon, everyone. I so wish that we were actually doing this in person um, on our site or on your campus, um, but we are going to uh, make the best of Zoom today and um, uh, share with you as much information as we possibly can. So um, as Chelsea mentioned, if you can turn your cameras on, um, that would be great because we love to have a little bit of feedback, even if it's only half inch square feedback. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, a question. Again, it's always like doing this in person, but we're going to do this and try this on Zoom just for the folks that I can see. Just sort of a show of hands. Um, how many of you are familiar with, think you're familiar with, or have heard of Raytheon before? That is a lot of hands already, look at that. Okay, okay, so this is gonna, oh, we're, uh, we are got, we got the high-tech hands and we've got the, the, the video hands, both of those work, so that's outstanding. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about Raytheon. I'm gonna share a little bit of information on the, the company and what it's like working for us. We've got a, a panel of folks that I'm gonna introduce um, um, about halfway through and I'm gonna ask them some questions. And what I'd really like to do is leave as much time as possible to, um, uh, uh, leave as much time as possible for questions from all of you. Um, so, you know, prepare those, um, put those in the chat and we will get to as many of those as we possibly can at the, uh, at the end of today's session. And hopefully um, when we're all done, uh, those of you who didn't raise your hands, I'm not sure I actually saw anybody that didn't raise their hands, but if there was any of, any of you out there that did not raise your hands, hopefully you will be able to raise your hand the next time I ask a question like that or someone asks you about Raytheon. And for those of you who did, you're gonna know a little bit more about, about our company when we're, um, uh, when we're done. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. I'm gonna share um, an information package that I'm gonna walk through. I've just lost the visibility of all of you, so hopefully. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about Raytheon, and, and you know, I started with asking you if you all knew um, who we are. Um, we are clearly an aerospace and defense company. I think most folks who think of Raytheon Technologies think of us as an aerospace and defense company. I don't think that folks really understand sort of the details um, of the systems that we provide, how much we provide, and how many different domains, and to, to how many different customers. Um, or how long we've been um, a, a company, so um, or recent changes. So uh, we are just going through. We're at the end of our second year of a merger with United Technologies. Um, uh, that merger took Raytheon Company, which is a nearly 100-year-old company that's comprised of parts of TI and Hughes Aircraft and all sorts of other legacy aerospace and defense companies. We merged with United Technologies um, two years ago, which brought um, Collins Aerospace and Pratt and & Whitney into the fold. So we're now a much larger company than we were before, um, uh, servicing customers around the world in both commercial and military spaces um, in a lot of different areas. So um, always good to start these things with a video. So um, something other than me talking at you. So I'm going to uh, um, share, um, uh, start with the video and then we'll we'll go on a little bit more. Hopefully you can hear this. Okay, Scooter, well, look, it's a great day to go fly. future is here. Safe connected flight, intelligence based technologies, smart defense systems, Raytheon technologies. All right. Um, I really like that video and I, I love the historic, uh, the footage in there. So highlights, um, you know, a, a lot of what we do and the fact that we've been around for a very, very long time. 
Um, when we talk about Raytheon, um, you know, we often talk about, you know, what it is that we do, what our key capabilities are. And you can see from the, the list on this page that, you know, we are much more than just um, a defense company, certainly just your typical A&D company. Um, having come together now as a larger company, uh, a larger business with Pratt, um, uh, Pratt and Whitney and Collins Aerospace, you can see that we we really, if it flies, whether it's commercial or defense, there's a portion of that aircraft or that system that we have a, a piece of. Um, everything from um, uh, the, the landing gear, the um, evacuation slides, the brakes and the like on commercial aircraft to the aircraft engines, uh, the interiors, the entertainment system, if you're still flying on a plane that has an entertainment system, those entertainment systems are brought to you by Collins Aerospace. Um, uh, the breadth of the capabilities in, uh, in our company are, are pretty vast. And that's supported by these numbers. Um, and I think when I look at these numbers, I think it's easy to get lost in the size of the numbers. Uh, we are a very large company, um, 181,000 employees. I think what's really kind of, if I take anything away from this, um, there are three numbers on this, this page that really, I think, speak to who we are more than anything else. That 181,000 is big. Um, it's a really big number, but I don't want folks to feel like, you know, it's such a big company that you're going to get lost. That 181,000 people uh, kind of talks to, there's 180,000 careers, different career paths that are being followed by folks in the company. So lots of opportunity when you have a company that's that size. The other number I think is really key is 61,000. 61,000 engineers. So a third of our company are engineers. Now, I know we've got business folks that are on this call today as well, but a third of what we do is, is, is engineering. That means that for you business folks, two thirds of what we do is not. But for us engineers, that's a big number, right? So lots of opportunities for engineers in a very large company. And the third number that I think is really key to kind of look at is 46,000 patents. So 46,000 patents across 61,000 engineers over all this, that is a lot of innovation. That's a lot of IP being developed. So um, we do pride ourselves on being on the cutting edge. You saw on the slide, it's just a, or in the, in the video, it's the future of aerospace and, and, and defense. We are um, at the cutting edge and the things that we do, the products that we develop really are um, pushing the envelope um, of, of what's possible, what's, what's capable in, in, in technology. So if that sort of thing interests you, um, I think you'll find a lot uh, with Raytheon that, uh, that is of interest. Um, like every company and every company, um, I think Chelsea said you're gonna, there's a meeting with Flora next week. I'm sure Flora has a vision. Um, I think um, all of our peers, everyone has a vision statement out there. Um, what I would take away from this when, when we talk about our vision is this idea that we're, uh, we have these five pillars, uh, uh, our values um, that we base our vision on, and that vision is a safer, more connected world. So you'll see there's elements of what we're doing, providing um, protection to our warfighter, protection to, our, um, to those folks who are flying commercial on our aircraft in a connected world with systems that are talking to each other. There's a lot of that sort of flavor in, a, in all that we do. And that's all built on these, these, these pillars, uh, our values of trust, respect, accountability, collaboration, and innovation. Um, I think a lot of folks will talk to trust and respect. Um, I think when we talk to those things, if I, if I think about our company from a respect perspective, it's really that idea that we're embracing diverse perspectives. And I'll talk a little bit about our, our commitment to diversity in a second. Um, we have a commitment to our customer um, and a pride in what we do. Um, I come and those of us who are on the call today come from the, uh, the defense side of things. Um, and so, you know, we know that um, our products have to work um, and if they don't work, um, there are really bad consequences. And so we take the value and the quality of our work very, very seriously. And I think that accountability is, you'll see that across the, the culture and the business. Um, collaboration is another value. I, as I just mentioned, we just went through a merger. We're now 181,000 employees. Um, the value of that merger comes in our ability to collaborate and to work across all those 881,000 folks and to learn from, um, you know, where we're pushing 
technology on the defense side, how do we um, um, uh, take that technology and apply it in a commercial application to the work that say Collins Aerospace is doing? Or how do we take the way that Collins Aerospace is approaching say commercial kinds of problems um, how do we take those lessons learned and apply them into a defense space? So collaboration is very key. And as I mentioned um, before with the 46,000 patents, innovation is absolutely a, a core principle, a core value of everything that we do. Um, what we do is near, near the point of breaking the laws of physics, we're pushing technology as far as we possibly can. And that really requires um, an extreme amount of innovation. And that innovation is gonna come from diversity of thought, which again, I'll talk to in a minute. Um, we're also a company that that um, considers our impact in um, in the communities um, uh, where we work and where we live. Um, we have a long history of supporting in those communities. Uh, myself personally, um, I had for a number of years led um, our STEM outreach. Um, have worked uh, with hundreds of employees over the years, uh, providing STEM education into. Um, uh, into the uh, K-12 schools in our various different areas. We have a strong commitment to those folks that, that we serve or those who serve uh, that we support, the, the, the warfighter and the women, uh, men and women uh, in the military. And again, in our, our communities, the picture you see there is supporting the food bank. Um, we've got a, a long history of supporting those kinds of community activities um, in all of the locations where we work. Um, and I'll share those uh, in, a, in a little bit as well. Um, very, uh, very strong commitment to uh, being engaged in the community. And so for those of you who as students are engaged in, in outreach through various different um, student clubs or organizations, or just like to be committed and, 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 and engaged in the community, um, Raytheon Technologies provides our volunteers um, give thousands of hours um, to the community every single year, and you would not be for uh, for want of an opportunity to engage. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion. Again, you're going to see this um, in a lot of different places. I mean, there's been um, there's uh, I think everyone recognizes the the desire to have an organization that reflects the communities that we work in. Um, but I've mentioned as mentioned a couple of times, there is a business reason for us to do this. Um, uh, we are, um, as again, I probably said three or four times now, a, an organization that's committed to innovation and to driving technology as far as we can. And that comes from having a diverse set of thoughts and ideas to drive that innovation. So our commitment to DE&I um, is not just because we think it's the right thing to do, which it clearly is, but there is a business benefit for us in doing that as well. That diversity of thought brings new ideas and drives the innovation that we need to succeed as a technology company. Um, and to support that DNAI, we have a number of employee research resource groups, um, not unlike you'll see in many other companies and like you see on your campus, we have uh, ERGs that support um, uh, a number of different uh, groups uh, across the business. Um, and of those 181,000 uh, employees, 40,000 are members of these ERGs. So very active ERG uh, community in, in Raytheon as well. Um, so our businesses, let's talk a little bit about who we are and, and, and what makes up uh, Raytheon Technologies. Um, so I alluded to the merger uh, with UTC. Um, prior to this merger, Raytheon, that you probably, um, if you're in Southern California, you probably have seen our facilities that that Raytheon was what we used to call space and airborne systems. There were four businesses in Raytheon that became two with the merger. Um, the folks that are with you today are from Raytheon Intelligence and Space. Uh, there's also another heritage Raytheon business called Raytheon Missiles and Defense. And then Collins Aerospace and Pratt & Whitney, which came to us from the UTC side of that merger. Um, each of the businesses has similarities, but also um, uh, has some characteristics that are unique to that business. Um, Collins, um, from, a, um, from a business perspective, from a, uh, from a size and diversity per perspective, looks a little bit more like the business that those of us on this call are, are, are in, uh, the intelligence and space business. They um, specialize, you can read the words here, it's aerostructures, avionics, interiors, anything that has to do with a commercial aircraft, they do more than that, but that's probably the easiest way to think about it. So if commercial aviation and those sorts of things are of interest to you, Collins has, has a role to play in all of that. Um, they're a very large business, you can see, um, of that 
total size, there are you know roughly a third of our entire um, our entire revenue, our sales at 19.4 billion dollars uh, and 68,000 employees. So they're a very large, very diverse business. Um, Pratt Whitney is the other business that came to us from from the Heritage UTC side. Um, Pratt Whitney um, is again they do more than this, but it's easiest to think of Pratt and Whitney as an engine business. Um, they make commercial engines. They make the engine for the F-35. Um, they're also a very large company, smaller in size and employees. Um, they have fewer employees than, than say Collins, but very large um, annual sales, lots of opportunity. If you are an aerospace engineer, a mechanical engineer, or are interested in um, composite materials and complex structures and, and, and that sort of thing, Pratt & Whitney is a fantastic place to work because they've got, uh, they do all of that and they do a lot of that. Now, Raytheon Intelligence Space is our business, um, uh, the, the business that the, the four of us on the call are from. Um, we are a collection of a number of different programs and of all the businesses I've mentioned earlier, we're a bit like Collins, but imagine Collins sort of on the defense side. Um, we are largely a defense oriented business. Um, we are also largely a sensors and software solutions business. So whereas um, Pratt makes um, um, Pratt makes engines and, and Collins makes commercial in, um, interiors and, and, and other products, we make the sensors and, and software solutions for those defense systems. Um, largely um, airborne and, and space. So you can think of things like the F-18 radar or um, if you've ever seen the uh, the ball that um, uh, that sits below some helicopters or a predator, that's a an MTS, a multispectral um, targeting system, uh, that is one of our large product lines. So we are um, comprised of a number of different businesses, everything from um, secure sensors to electronic warfare, um, uh, ISR products, communications products, and space products. And happy to answer any detailed questions as we get uh, as we get further into this. Um, the last of the four businesses is Raytheon Missiles and Defense. They are um, largely in Tucson, Arizona, and as the name suggests, um, uh, probably about half of that business is developing missile products. Um, so everything from the Sidewinder to um, Tomahawk missiles to the like are all produced by um, RMD. Um, they also do large um, shipboard and land radar systems out of um, a heritage uh, defense systems business in the Northeast, um, roughly the same size as the other heritage Raytheon business. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Aaron Pruitt here in a moment. Um, Aaron is um, our early and career lead from talent acquisition. And um, the, the next handful of slides before we get into the, uh, the panel discussion are going to share a little bit about what our hiring process looks like and, and, and the like. But I wanted to, to, to hang on this page for just a little bit. Um, as you can see, um, we are a very geographically diverse um, location. So while you can see we have large portions of the business and here in Southern California, in the Tucson, Arizona, Dallas and Northeast and DC, um, we have facilities and sites all over the country. Um, so before I hand this off to Aaron, um, one of the things that I'd like you to think about from Raytheon, and again, hopefully I didn't scare folks with the large numbers early on, but we're a very large and diverse business, but that also means that it's full of lots of different opportunities and, uh, and the like. I myself have been with the company for 27 years, um, actually in two different stints. Um, I came to the company in 2003, and I think since 2003, um, so not quite 20 years this time, I have had probably 11 different roles, maybe 10 different roles. Um, and across very, very different domains, um, doing a lot of different things in that period of time. So with that, um, Aaron, are you there? I am. So would you mind uh, walking us through sort of the hiring process and what that looks like? Yes, absolutely. So I know there are a lot of questions coming through the chat about our hiring process. So hope I can answer the majority of these questions. And then once we get to the Q&A section, if there's any additional, we'll certainly go over those as well. 
Um, but just a few things to hit on from, from this particular slide. Um, we do hire across the country um, for both our internship as well as our new grad positions. You can see of our different business units, the headquarters for each of those, they're on the bottom left. Um, and if you wanna go ahead and jump over to the next slide. So the type of students we hire, we do hire full-time new graduates into new grad from undergrad as well as master de master's degree and PhD programs. We also have our leadership development programs as well as our intern and co-op opportunities. Next slide. So managing through the COVID pandemic, hopefully we are on the outskirts of this pandemic. Everybody cross your fingers, do a little happy dance, whatever you need to do. But Raytheon has been very cognizant of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we do have employees who job, whose job requires them to be on site. And we've certainly um, made sure that they are safe when they come on site, face masks, um, COVID mandates, all of those details, but we are starting to see that the number of COVID cases are going down so we can kind of relax those policies and allow more employees on site. And hopefully we can continue that, especially as we get into the summer and prepare for our summer interns. Next slide. So just to kind of dive into what makes up our interns versus our new college graduates. So internships versus co-ops, our interns are usually during the summer, about 10 to 12 weeks, depending on school schedule. Um, obviously you want to be respectful of the time you're in school, finishing finals and preparing to go back in the fall. Um, so they do typically last from the May to August timeframe with a little bit of flexibility there. Um, those are available for both master's degree and ma or bachelor's and master's degree students, so long as you're in the middle of pursuing that degree. Co-ops are usually longer in length during the school semester. So whether that is from the September to December timeframe or January through May timeframe. Those are um, usually taken in place of a college course during that semester. Our full-time positions, um, oh, go back. So our full-time positions are for those who have successfully completed their degree, whether that is a bachelor's or master's degree. We do say a 3.0 or above GPA is desired. Um, certainly is some flexibility around that, um, maybe not necessarily on some of the leadership development programs, but certainly for our traditional new grad um, opportunities, there is that flexibility. And these positions, again, are all across the United States. Um, and the majority of them do provide relocation assistance if you're open to relocating outside of Southern California. Next slide. Yeah. So our leadership development programs, we do have these across all of our business functions. So contracts, IT, finance is a really big one. Same thing with operations and supply chain. That is another long one, or another larger one as well. Um, these are rotational opportunities across multiple business units. So you could start off within RIS, Raytheon Intelligence and Space, go to Collins, go to Pratt, and get that wide variety of experience. Next slide. So this dives into a little bit more of, and I don't know, is everybody else seeing the, the gray box? Because it's blocking my screen. There we go, much better. Um, thanks, Noel. Um, but these are the different functional disciplines for our leadership development program. You can see the different areas. So for engineering, um, you have the opportunity to spend a um, rotation in software, and then maybe you go to research and development, then maybe you go to advanced manufacturing, getting kind of that robust experience under your belt so that whenever you get through the LVP program, you can really transition and be a very solid engineer. Next slide. So this is just a little bit of the, the candidate profile that we typically look for in our LDP candidate 
definitely looking for someone who wants a leadership opportunity. So have those skills and experience to bring to the table. Um, they want to ultimately become a functional leader. Um, they either have a undergrad or a graduate degree and um, have a relevant internship or co-op experience. And also what is really important is that ability to travel across the United States since you will be supporting all of our business functions during it at one of those rotation experiences. So we hire across all the majors. So while engineering is our, our bread and butter, um, I know we have representation from our, our business schools here as well. We do have a significant hiring opportunity for finance, supply chain, um, human resources, as well as our cybersecurity as well. So don't just think of Raytheon as a engineering company, but also for those business students as well. Um, it, it is a great opportunity to get your experience within aerospace and defense. So what we offer as far as benefits, um, for our full-time employees, we do have flexible work arrangements, health insurance, 401k, PTO, um, all of those details. One big thing that we really went through after our merger was our, um, we really analyzed our education, our student loan um, plan so that students or Raytheon employees can go back for their master's degree and continue that education, continue to be a better engineer or a better um, finance um, analyst, financial analyst, whatever they're doing in their career, um, definitely want to continue those educational opportunities for our employees. Um, as Noel mentioned, we do also have volunteer and community impact events, our employee resource groups, and tons of career advancement opportunities. So a quick overview of our recruiting process. You can go to rtx.com slash careers. We have actually added a early in career tab back in, I believe it was January, so that you can see um, our new graduate as well as our internship opportunities. You can set up job notifications. So as these opportunities do come available, you'll get an email notification. That way you can go in and apply rather quickly. And then once you do apply to a position, a recruiter will review your resume and pass you along accordingly to uh, the hiring manager. I would just say it's super important that as you're reviewing the opportunities, take a look, make sure you review kind of what the requirements are and align with those requirements. All right, next up. So, that is everything, a super high level overview of kind of once you get um, consider Raytheon, go out, apply, and then we can consider you further. Thanks, Erin. And uh, my apologies to those folks. I was trying to read the chat while we were going, and it, it seems that probably showed up as a gray box on those screens. So hopefully you can be able to catch all of those details. Um, <clears throat> we are going to do our best to capture and, and respond to all of these questions before the end. Uh, so continue to uh, ask questions and we will get to them as we can. Um, I'd like to move on though right now to the sort of the next part of um, our presentation and, and sharing of information today is our panel discussion. So we've got two panelists that are going to join us, Kento Miller and Lynn Prushan. Um, uh, I should note that as I was mentioning geographic diversity, I'm here in Southern California with most of you. Um, uh, Aaron, who just spoke, uh, was in Texas, and Kento is joining us from Sterling, Virginia, um, and Lynn is here in Southern California. So um, what I'm going to ask uh, each of them to do is to introduce themselves, a little bit about their background, uh, their, their history at Raytheon, and I'm going to ask one other question. If you could, as you're introducing yourself, tell us the best part about your job. So uh, Kento, um, you are Engineering Fellow, Sterling, Virginia. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Very glad to be here. I'm um, I'm a graduate from Cal Poly. I'm probably the only one that's on this uh, Zoom that's a graduate from 1981. And if you do math in public, that's over 40 years in engineering that I've been in the business. Um, I've been supporting the Defense Department uh, from day one. 
Um, I worked uh, 11 years at Lockheed Skunk Works when I first got out of, out of uh, Cal Poly. Um, and then my wife had a great idea about moving to the East Coast. And uh, then I started working for the Secretary of the Air Force in acquisition. And I did that for 17 years, uh, during which I supported the F-18 program, the F-35 program. Um, just to digress a little bit, when I was in Skunk Works, I supported the SR-71. It was actually still flying at the time. And then moved on to the F-22 and then uh, F-35. And then um, I'm probably the youngest employee at Raytheon. I've been at Raytheon for six years. And... Um, been working on program protection during that time. And so you can probably guess that's not engineering per se, uh, but I do use my engineering skills to help protect weapon systems. And so, uh, so that's my 40 years. Uh, the part that I really like about uh, Raytheon is, is the people. I know Noel talked about this in the beginning, um, but when you're around other professionals uh, that want, that have a mission, and want to get a job done. Uh, you're all part of a team, and I'm sure you do a lot of teamwork at Cal Poly today, um, but you're still part of a team, and they want to see you to be successful. And when you're successful, that means the team's is successful, and you get a product out the door. And, and um, even though we work for the DOD, our, our, our mission is always to protect the warfighter, and that's who we support as a warfighter. Um, because we want them to be outmanned or, or outgunned and do everything above and beyond our adversaries. And so the more successful we can make our, our warfighter, the better off we are. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that um, Raytheon has allowed me uh, to excel in other areas. And so I've taken a lot of training, uh, even though I've been in this business for 40 years, uh, uh, it's never, you can't stop learning, okay? And so I was able to get a master's degree uh, a few years ago and uh, in system engineering. And um, that's, that's boosted me up to do other opportunities. And so um, I think I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Kento. That was fantastic. And Lynn, I'm gonna move to you. So uh, Lynn, um, here in Southern California, works um, uh, has has been in Mission Assurance, which is a different part now, part of engineering, um, engineering Mission Assurance. But Lynn, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and a little bit of your background. Yeah, and and the best part of your job. What is the best part of your job? All right, thanks so much, Noel, and uh, thank you all for having me here today. My name is Lynn, and I work in Mission Assurance, as Noel said, in the Learning, Engagement, and Operations section of Mission Assurance. I have over 30 years with Raytheon slash Hughes. I actually joined Hughes Aircraft Company uh, back in the late 80s. Um, I have a degree in business administration and I started my career with, with Hughes Aircraft Company in the finance department and served many roles while I was in finance um, over the many years uh, from an analyst, a program control analyst, um, and a trainer for the tools that we used in finance, creating tools, I'm dating myself back to before employees had computers. We all had 10 key, you know, yeah, units at our desks. And uh, I took a break for about 12 years in the middle of my career to raise my family. And I was very fortunate that, you know, ahead of their time, Raytheon was willing to work with me and, uh, and honor my need for work-life balance. And I always kept my foot in the door. And, and when I was ready to come back, I did. I came back full time and I became the finance manager for several of the functions in Raytheon, including engineering and mission assurance which is where I developed my, my passion for Mission Assurance. So several years ago, I joined Mission Assurance. I left finance. So Raytheon offers a tremendous opportunity to do all sorts of things that you might want to do and touch in your, in your time with us. And 
um, in this role, which is my favorite part of my job so far, is I get to work with the early in career um, hires. So I work a lot with Erin, and um, I am responsible for the interns in the Mission Assurance Organization and creating a robust, engaging in opportunity to not only succeed in the role that you are assigned during your internship, but beyond that, having the connections with engineering, with operations, with supply chain, with the leaders and um, with the other interns on site and virtually. And it's really just, uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous opportunity. I, I get to follow the early in career employees for two years and just serve as that additional support system. Uh, I'm very grateful for the role that I have at Raytheon. Thank, Thank you, Lynn. You. And, and I'm sure the interns are, are grateful for the role that you have Raytheon as well. So um, an outstanding experience for them. Um, I, I had a, another question I was going to ask both, uh, both Ken and, and, and Lynn, and I see that Edward has asked a similar question. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lead with an answer of my own and then ask um, the two of you to, 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 to pipe in. So Edward had asked, what separates Raytheon from Lockheed and Northrop? Um, I was going to say a couple of blocks, but maybe that fun, that joke isn't as funny or doesn't play as well um, on Zoom. Um, but what separates? What makes us different? So the question I'm going to ask um, you after I, I go into this is, you know, what makes Raytheon different? And um, I would say there's a, there's a couple things when I when I look at it. So if you look at the aerospace and defense industry, and you and you many folks will lump Raytheon with Lockheed and Northrop. Um, Probably the, the most significant thing, at least as far as an output, is um, Raytheon is, doesn't produce airframes. We don't make things that necessarily fly um, by themselves. We make the sensors, the systems that are within those systems. So Northrop and Lockheed are both um, airframe manufacturers. Um, they both produce aircraft as well as the systems that go in them. Um, but they sit at a, at a slightly different level. And where I think that makes Raytheon a little bit different is we work with Lockheed and Northrop in a number of different areas. So it's not uncommon for us to, when Lockheed and Northrop are looking to bid a new aircraft or a new system to the go government, that we might be a portion of, a part of both of those bids because they're looking to the best of the sensors, the best capabilities that are out there. I mean, the planes, if you take the F-35, it's a fantastic plane. It does a lot of things by itself and, you know, uh, great job on those who design the aircraft, but what really makes it work are those sets, those systems. Um, it's the it's the the radar and the engine and, and the like, and so we're a part of all of that. So I think um, there was a, a TV ad from years ago. I think it was BASF that said, "We don't make X, we make X better." That's sort of where we are, where we fit. So we're different from Lockheed and Northrop in that respect. I think we're also different from from them. Uh, and from our other aerospace and defense competitors, whether it be L3 or, um, or um, uh, BAE or the like, in that this merger has created a company that is now 50% international, 50% domestic, 50% commercial, 50% defense. We are a very diverse um, company, much more so than we ever were in the past. And I talked about that collaboration and learning from each other. My hope, um, and we're still early on in the merger, but my hope is that we're going to further differentiate ourselves from those other competitors um, by adopting more commercial practices to the way we deliver de uh, defense systems, and that will put us in um, at a, a, a competitive advantage against those. So, I mean, apart from we just don't make air airplanes, um, and that makes us different. I think the structure of our business and the um, the diversity of our business um, separates us from them as well. Um, so having said that, I'm going to, we'll start with you, Lynn. Um, hope I didn't catch you off guard there, but uh, what do no, you think? No, you didn't catch me off guard, but you know, I, I really, I don't work in the engineering side of the business. And so I, I would have to say that when I, when I listen to and uh, collaborate with HR and with talent, you know, what we really offer is that connection with the employees. Employees are a valuable asset for us. I can't say that they aren't also valued at the other companies, but you can't do better than Raytheon when it comes to having a company and especially consider the size that we are with, as, as Noel said, the, the diversity in opportunities and our commitment to excellence and to employee satisfaction. And it's just unparalleled. 
Thanks. Um, and Kent, you've got a, you're sitting closer to our headquarters there in, in DC and um, have had uh, experience outside of uh, the company more recently than Lynn and I have. So uh, what's, right. what's your take on that? So, so you sort of said it yourself, uh, Knowles, that uh, when, when you belong to Lockheed or you belong to Northrop, you tend to be an airframe. Um, yes, there are some subsidiaries beyond that, but uh, what I see in Raytheon is if you're an electrical engineer and you saw the, the United States map and all those red dots, I would say 90% of those red dots, you could go find a job, okay? And the other great thing is that you know, even if you're a cyber person uh, and you start a job in El Segundo and you want to, uh, you know, you're interested in going to Texas, you know, this company will allow you to do that and allow you to move. And they want you to excel. And if that means uh, one part of Raytheon loses you, they know that another part is gaining you. And so um, that's one thing I appreciate about Raytheon is the, the flexibility. In, in anything you want to do, they are uh, willing to uh, listen, listen. So thank you. Oh, thanks. And and I'll I'll just follow up and, and say something else on 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 that point. Where, um, you know, one of the things that I often share with students when they're when you're looking at um, when you're looking at where you want to go work and 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 what career you want to pursue. Um, all of, all of those of us who are going to come and talk to you, we're going to tell you how great we think our company is and what I think we have to offer. And we're going to be sincere, and, and we truly believe that. Um, I will tell you that um, not every company is the right fit for everybody. Um, I think that we are the right fit for most folks, um, but we're not necessarily going to be the right fit for everybody. And, and I want to be open and share that with you. I think for those folks who feel like they might get lost in a large company, what I would tell you, though, is... Um, you know, we don't operate as if we're that large a company. When you're working on a program, you're working with that program team. And it feels like, um, so for my history, um, I, I left Hughes Aircraft a number of years ago and went to work for a startup um, in San Francisco. So I was in San Francisco during the dot-com boom, working in the startup industry. And I can tell you the teams that I worked with then don't feel any different than the teams I work with now because you just work with those folks that you work next to. So it's a big company. But what that allows you to do is that when, you know, when that startup doesn't get funding or that project ends, when the startup doesn't get, a, doesn't get funding, that business goes, goes out of business. Um, when your project ends, there's another project in a large business like this that you can pick up. So I think that's one, one way to, uh, one thing to consider. Um, there was another question I was going to leave to the end, but I'm seeing, so Kevin, so first, Fabian, thank you for getting my joke. I appreciate that. Um, make, makes me feel better. Um, so Kevin asked a question about advice that you would give to a graduating engineering student. How do you stand out and what do you wish new engineers knew? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to turn that to Kent first and, and Aaron, if you've got some comments on that, I'd like you to share as well. Um, but I will share one thing, um, uh, before I hand it off, uh, we talked a little bit about the, um, the uh, Employee Scholars Program. I don't know if we named it uh, such, but it's our reimbursement program for, uh, for grad school. Um, what I will tell all of you who are undergrads, if you've got your master's degree already or pursuing your PhD, good for you, keep going down that path. If you're a bachelor student and are wondering whether or not you should go back to grad school and get your master's right now, um, this is not a universal answer like, the, like I said before. Everybody's a little bit different. For some folks, just getting it done now is the right thing. But if you have any doubt, I would encourage you to find a job and go work for a little bit. I will tell you from personal experience, um, I, I'm not a Cal Poly grad. I, uh, I was a, a Purdue grad, an electrical engineer uh, a lot of years ago. Working was not at all like school was, and the opportunities that were available to me in the workforce were very different than what they were in school, and I would have never thought to pursue some of the things that I pursued had I not had that work experience first. So if you've got any doubt, I would encourage you to go to work first, spend some time learning what working is like, and then have a company like ours pay you back um, and pay you to go get that degree. We will, um, our program, I think I can share this, Aaron, you can shake your head if I can't share the numbers. Okay. Um, 
we, we provide $25,000 a year in tuition reimbursement for anyone going back to pursue a degree that's of value to, to our business. So if you're an engineer and want to get an MBA, you can do that. We prefer you get a master's in electromagnetics, but you can get whatever you want. And we provide that as a benefit. So I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity there. And I, that would be my piece of advice. So um, Kent, why don't I go to you? So uh, just to follow on with that, uh, I got my master's 20 years after I graduated from Cal Poly. And if I had done it earlier, it would have probably been something different. Um, and I probably would have made a big mistake. And so my master's was in system engineering. And so that that propelled me to do other jobs besides engineering that I was doing in the past. And so that's one of the benefits of getting a master's degree is that you can deviate a little bit from what you were doing and then go down another road and, and excel on that path. Um, as far as uh, recommendations of new students coming into any business is always say yes. Okay, so when your boss comes up to you, your new boss and says, I have an opportunity for you to do X, Y, Z, your answer should always, always, always be yes, okay? Um, because the more opportunity you to do a uh, diverse set of, of, of uh, skills, the better off you're gonna be, and the more employable you'll be later on. Um, just like Noel said, he's an he's a engineer by trade, but he's in HR right now. And so um, just because today or when you graduate, you do one set of jobs, doesn't mean you're gonna be doing that for 20 years, okay? Um, and that's a great thing about Raytheon is that when you see another opportunity available to you, then take it, you know, something else uh, grabs your attention, take it, okay? And so that's my words of wisdom. Um, it's always good to be around uh, smart people. Um, they typically are smarter than you when you first start out. Uh, but that's a learn, learning experience for you. And so my second piece of wisdom is to listen. Listen, okay? Say yes, I'll take the job and, and listen uh, when you ask a question. And, and people respond to that because they're always, uh, your, your, your uh, team members are always willing to help make you successful. Thanks. Thanks, Kent. Um, Aaron, um, uh, any, uh, any advice or, uh, that you would have for, for new grads and hires, things that they should know or help them? Their question was, how do they stand out? And you see a lot of resumes and a lot of folks. So what, what advice would you have? Yeah, absolutely. So from the resume perspective, I would definitely say, um, as you're reviewing the, the job description, tailor your resume to that particular position. If it's asking for experience in C++ and you have that from a project, add that in there. Um, that's how you're gonna get the attention of hiring managers, recruiters. Um, so being able to actually talk to that experience when you get to an interview, being able to show whether it's leadership experience in school or outside of school maybe, you're in um, a club outside of school or, or something, you volunteer, being able to show that experience is really going to be helpful. And then once you get in at Raytheon, intern, new grad, as kind of Kinto mentioned, um, the experience is what you make it. So say yes to those opportunities, but also be proactive. Um, don't just wait for an opportunity to come to you. Go out and look for opportunities, get involved, be active in our employee resource groups. That's really going to help you get your name out there and get people to know you so that, oh, hey, I actually had a new project come up. I know from, I, I, I know Noel from this employee resource group, and he was telling me he wanted more experience in electromagnetics. I, I'm going to reach out to him, see if it's something he's interested in. So being able to get your name out there, be proactive is really going to help you. Shay, I think then since you mentioned electromagnetics again, and Alfredo had had a question regarding yep. that, I was just using that as an example. Um, uh, uh, my, my comment was, was driven by, you know, we, we look for engineers and hope that engineers are going to want to pursue um, pursue uh, studies and, um, and degrees in engineering. 
uh, to make them more complete, um, uh, deeper engineers. Um, so electromagnetics was just an example. It could have been any one of a number of different uh, technical topics other than, and then finance or business. But um, Lynn, I didn't want to leave you aside. And then Chelsea, I'm going to come back to you here in a second. So any other advice that Lynn, you would have, or what makes um, you work with a lot of interns, what makes them stand out? I'm happy to answer that question. So Aaron gave you a sound advice. Do please tailor your resumes to the role. It's not a one size fits all, especially if you're applying for multiple roles within Raytheon, because we want to get you through the rate through the resume screening process. And if you come for an interview, do some research. Know why Raytheon. I, I hear that question all the time. What is it about Raytheon that interests you? What are you looking for in a job with Raytheon? Because it is as much about your satisfaction, you pursuing what you're interested in, as it is important for us to have someone who has the right skill set that we're looking for. And then when you get the job, take risks. You know, Kento said it, you know, say yes. But, but that often includes taking risks. You know, get out of your comfort zone. We celebrate employees who are willing to take those risks and get that variety of experience. It makes you a very valuable employee in the short term and in the long run. Those would be my pieces of advice for you. Well, thanks, Lynn. I, I think those are really good. And I. Um, I just, I'm reading some of these comments on the side. So Jordan, thank you for the kind words. And, and you have heard probably from, from all of us at some point today that um, I think we all take pride in the work that we do for the country. And, and there is a sense of, um, I probably could have said what makes Raytheon different, maybe not from Lockheed and Northrop, but certainly from our, um, our other commercial peers. Um, you will find that within the business, there is a culture and a sense that what we're doing really matters, that we that we care about the warfighter, that we care about our nation, and that we're doing those things that um, really make a difference. Um, I think the other thing that you'll find, and Kento mentioned this uh, a number of times, there is a lot of really smart people here. I mean, just um, really a lot of smart people. In a, in, a, in a previous life, one of my past roles was leading our electronics engineering center. Um, and I was you know, very uh, privileged and fortunate to leave, lead an organization of about 1,300 folks um, of which about 300 were PhDs, and I can't remember how many how many masters we had. I've got a master's degree and some some postgraduate work as well. But I was rarely, even as the leader of that organization, was rarely, if ever, the smartest person in the room. There's always somebody that knows something more than you do, um, and I think that's an important thing to um, to take away as well. Um, I see that we're coming up um, close to time. We've only got about five minutes left, and I haven't been able to effectively get through the chat the way that I'd like. Um, Chelsea, I'm gonna. Um, hand it back to you. Could you help maybe facilitate some of these questions and we'll try to get as many answered as we can? Of course, be my pleasure. And students, I know some of you have to walk to class. If you need to log off early, that's okay. So we will have a recording at a later date. Okay, so we did have a question earlier on that talked about um, where are the vol volunteering events held? So um, I would say the last two years, my answer is going to be a little bit different than it's been prior to that. Um, but um, the volunteer events are um, are all over the place, um, um, both on our campus and on other campuses. Um, I, I don't know if I can if I can um, if I can uh, overstate this. Um, we really value our commitment to the communities that we work in, and there are literally hundreds of opportunities for you to, uh, to volunteer. And so um, those volunteer events could be, um, I did an event at 32nd Street School in downtown LA. Um, I've hosted students and volunteer events on our campus. And every year around Thanksgiving, we have folks at the food bank loading boxes of food. Um, I, there are opportunities to volunteer um, um, everywhere and on everything from STEM outreach to community support to mentoring to, I don't know, there's probably a ha handful of other things I can't think of, but we they are. Site, we have a site that provides those recommendations that, that work with Raytheon. Yeah, so if you have a particular interest, I'm sure you could find an interest that would, would align to that. So our site supported Habitat for Humanity for a few weekends. And so you volunteer on a Saturday working, you know, eight hours for the day. 
So it makes you feel good when you build something. Awesome, thank you. All right, I have another question. Um, how much does one travel for work? And in, in thinking about students that might be interning, is there work mode flexibility for students that are here in Pomona? Um, so I will take part of that and I'll look to Lynn and Aaron who might have a, a portion of that answer. So uh, we were joking before we actually went live. Um, for some of us, travel is just a part or was a part of our, our, our daily business. Um, uh, I traveled um, almost every week. Um, but for most folks, there is little to no travel. Um, and I think you will find opportunities. Again, we're talking about a very large company. Um, the majority, overwhelming majority of folks will not travel. Um, they will be on site. Um, uh, I think as you, as you move up in your career and you start to collaborate more across the organization, I think the need to travel is greater. Um, uh, Aaron uh, or Lynn, uh, the, the question with regard to uh, internships and in Pomona versus Goleta, et cetera. I, I missed the second part of that. What was the question about interns? Is there work mode flexibility for students that are here in Pomona? And I can take this one, Lynn, if you want me to. Um, I will say one of the, the good things that came out of the COVID pandemic is we learned how to work remotely. Um, so there, there is a little bit more of that flexibility. However, if you're on site, maybe you're, you're working in a skiff, so you're working on, in a role that requires you to have a security clearance, you may have to be on site for that. Or if you're, if the internship position does require you to be hands-on in the lab, you're, you're going to have to be on site for that. But I think that's part of one of the discussions that you bring up during an interview is it could, is this hybrid? And a lot of our positions will say it in the job title, if it's going to be on site, hybrid or remote. Thank you. All right. I know that